chat, hosh omadid, and welcome to this Thursday stream of Las Plumas de Simur. My name is Plumas and I am but delighted to be here with you. And I just realized my camera is lit. Like, tell, just get me a moment, just a, just a wee second for us to fix it. As I fix the camera that is crooked, tad bit like me, you can tell me that's much better. Yeah. Salam! How are you? It's been... Oh, look at this. I am in my Modar Bozorg era because this is clearly, like, finally, finally the cold has come and I am beyond happy because uh, this is the season I enjoy the most. And, um, yeah, I, I can just prop myself up in this scarf... scarf show... Uh, I don't know how to call this because it's basically a blanket, but you you wrap it around your neck, supposedly. But I am here with my lemon tea, which I I adore, and I'm holding the cup because it's freezing, and I'm so happy. I'm beyond excited to be with you here today. Salam, Serapis, how are you? I missed you. Um, how's classes going? How is uni and how are your students? How are my fans? <laughs> I am their fan, actually, because um, I, I think I love them as much as they love me. I, I would love for someone to come and say, Hi, I'm Serapis, a student. I would love that. Salam, uh, Salam, Salam, Bizir, how are you? And um, uh, the best blankets are the ones you can wear out on the street, definitely. And I have plenty of those because, uh, well, maybe some of you don't know this, but I used to live in Scotland and there was um, absolutely justified to wear your blankets outside. So I have a bunch of clothes tailored for a very hard winter in the north of Scotland. And, and sometimes I cannot wear them because it, it, it a wee bit too warm for me here in the Spanish climate. However, I try because I really like them. They're very cozy and, and just wonderful on the skin. Salam, Humberto! I'm here to. I'm ready to have a crappy day vastly improved by some plumas. Oh no, what happened? Do you need me to muster the immortals and kick someone else's butt? Because I would. For you, I would. I mean, I'm not one for violence, but if someone dares touch our dear Umberto, they'll have to face me and the Safa Chancla. And Umberto knows what a Chancla is because he is a nonna. Just saying. Like, you serious are fine. We will see today the Roman Republic. Bless them. I am like, my condolences today. Not because of you. You are a fantastic, beneficent teacher. And uh, yes. Good points for talking about Parthia, but Roman Republic. And I can say that because my friend, um, very good friends with Pedro Huertas. Um, I I can't say that about the Roman Republic. But if you do say nee, 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 about the Roman Republic yourself, I'm gonna be so proud of you. <laughs> but I hope we can fix this not so great week, day moment, afternoon, minutes with some poetry and some story. Oh, thank you, no, soy Rose. Thank you so much. I, I, I do, I do feel better myself when I come live and I talk to you. So I think this is a double, it's a two-way street, you know? It's a double-edged, beautiful sword where in both ages standing, just put happiness and rejoicement because when I come and uh, talk to you, and, uh, you know, chat a wee bit about things that I like and you guys in retribution also like them. It's just this, this never-ending cycle of upbeat messages and feeling good feelings. So thank you for that. Um, hi, hi, Captain. I didn't see you there. Hi, Pichu. Because it's cold, I have here my device to keep my tea warm. And I, I'm i just realizing I have zero idea of how to call this. Not even in my mother tongue. I have no clue on how would you define this. Basically, it's, it's, um, it's a ceramic base with a hole on top. And on the inside, you put a candle. And then 
the mug rests on top of the of the surface, that one that's open with a hole. Thus, the heat comes from the bottom and maintains the the drink warmer and you know a longer for a longer time. And given how nippy it is in this room at the moment, best invention ever. This was a Christmas present. It was um this stream has two sentences. We can say it's a panic stream. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so the captain's here. We are in session. We can start today. I think we will jump right into it because oh my god, like that. Um, and allow me to to put oh, what image should I use? Because uh, all of them are wonderful. Ah, I'm gonna use him. I'm gonna use him. Like like like. Who am I kidding? I am. Um, oh, why why is this crooked? Like my brain. Okay, so. But uh, I think we can start with today's topic and uh, how wonderful it is to come here to speak about manuscripts, which are my true passion and basically the 70% of my whole research. What does that set up is my friends and I played Edge of Empires 4 yesterday and the Abbasid destroyed us all. It chose China. Not a single landmark survived. I am. I mean, on the one hand, I am impressed and I condone the Abbasid Caliphate behavior. Very accurate, very historically accurate. I mean, um, but on the other, I'm sorry, you, you, you bit the dust. But are you having, are you having your revenge? Are you having the, um, the revancha? I, the, the word revancha it just escaped entirely my brain. How do you say revancha in English? I don't know. I, I I used to know that word. I can't for, like, I can't remember right now. Uh, today, okay, on that note, today I revenge. Yeah, but no, now it's like my vengeance. I'm talking about. I'm gonna Google that because uh, you know, I was on that note about forgetting words. I was uh, yeah, rematch. That one, rematch, that was it. I mean, if I get, uh, I was watching a TikTok today from a person that also speaks Spanish and English. And uh, someone in the comments made fun of them. Salam, Sahrab, are you okay, Khubi? Um Yeah, someone in the comment of their TikTok account, uh, they made fun of them because they couldn't remember either a word in Spanish or in English or something. And this person, very elegantly, because they really liked how they put it into words, they said, like, daringly but nicely, basically, they, they asked the person on the comment, do you speak to languages? How many languages do you speak? Because if I forget things, because I know them. And they love that, because I used to be, when I was younger, and stupid, I used to be so ashamed of me not speaking perfect English. And then you, all the time, you realize how incredible it is that you can communicate in another language with a bunch of people that don't speak your mother tongue. And that is all I am up for. Saying that I used to be very ashamed of my accent because it was not perfect. And uh, sometimes when it shows and people tell me, oh, you have an accent. Exactly, I do, because I'm Spanish and because I am not, I'm not... Uh, a native speaker, although I, I was raised speaking English and studied it, but I'm not a native speaker. Um, but but you know what? It's just you have an accent. Yes, I do. Yeah, because I speak more than one. It's just uh, there's an entire land of people who speak in perfect English called the USA. <laughs> yes, there is. Look, there is this meme going around that. Uh, it's a person and it says no native typing an email and the email says, I apologize for my very poor vocabulary. I am attempting to compel the words exactly to be describing what I feel, blah, blah, blah. And then on the page, like on the image below, there's another person and it says native speaker and they literally reply, lol, it's okay. It's it is exactly as such. It is exactly as such. We as non-native speakers judge ourselves harder way harder than native speakers do judges native speakers do not judge us <laughs> not not all of them some people do but that is not because of a matter of language that's a matter of like you know stupidity um 
Oh yes, I I do know how Pichu. Like um, I I love the Scottish accent. However, I I wouldn't say I have a Scottish accent. If anything, I would have a Northern English accent because of the people I used to be surrounded with when I was living in Scotland. But definitely not Scottish. I mean, I I you should you should listen. Like the, the proper Scottish accent is something I don't have, and I don't think I'm capable of imitating it. But anywho, this is um this is a little bit off topic. But but I said that that we we're going to talk about manuscripts, which uh, for a very long time had I was what is speaking the past, and that is not accurate. They have and continue to be a fundamental part of my research. And today I wanted to talk about a classic, a huge name in the world of manuscripts from the Persianate. And um, honestly, if you ask me, a must. This is one of these topics when I presented it to my patrons, I was so glad they voted for it because there are just certain things that you have to know. There are certain people whose existence you ought to be aware of. And one of them is definitely Nezami Gonjovi. You already know the existence of Ferdowsi, and that is something I am vibing with because, yes, I put... I don't know if it was me. Salam, Nana! Are you okay? I don't know if this was me or the circumstances, but somehow you already know that Ferdowsi was a person that existed and wrote the best book in the history of literature, which I do have a pile of books here. Uh, do you want to see them? I can show you. I can show you the books I have because they're super interesting. and I do recommend every single one of them. I have the show no me. Duh, of course. I I do enjoy saying that I base my personality off this book because one it is true and second I just love saying that it's just yeah um then I have a beautiful edition of the Iskandar Nome and uh it's a commented one it's a um it's it's sort of not um well it's this one <laughs> Alexander the Great in the Persian Tradition, History, Myth and Legend in Medieval Era. And this is a very good book. It's thin, it's approachable. Um Khaili Ma'am Noon Saharab, that is a that is a big thing. And um it's much more commentary on the sources than uh anything else. But I really, really like this one. I do recommend it. Then we have one that was published recently, I think it was 2022. I want to think. Let me just check it. Is it 2022? Yes, 2021. Um, and it is Samak the Ayar, which is one of my favorite stories in the world of Persian literature. This one is just so good. So good. I... I I need you to know of Samak. And then I have this book about, about the Shahnameh. This is not the Shahnameh. It's a book that is called The Persian Epic as World well, Literature. Also super recommended and very thin. Um, so yeah, there you have it. I have, And then I have all the stuff that you cannot see because it's a work in progress. And um, so yeah, this person, the person we will be talking about today is a must. <laughs> Yes, Samak the Ayar. Yes, yes, Samak the Ayar. Have you read it? Do you know Samak? Have you have you enjoyed the adventures of Samak and the Prince of the Sun? Oh my god! So this person now will be occupying our time today. It's a must. You, you have to know of him. Um, and uh, these... Um, okay, this is going to be huge. It's going to be a solid a saving, but today's topic, I dare say, is as important and relevant for literature written in Persian as the Book of Kings. And that, that is a notorious statement coming from me. But you know how devotedly devoted myself to the Shahnameh mean, since everything started here. And I continue to give you information about this book and the stories inside it constantly. Nevertheless, I sort of started these series. We could say of streams dedicated to literature in Persian and the stories, authors and books. So far we've covered the Garishas Nome and I think that oh, but we have to start somewhere. Without further ado, let us jump right into it. Butcha, 
Today, we will be learning about the five treasures, the five wonders, the five stories versified by no other than the illustrious poet Nezami Ganjobi. Please give him the warmest of welcomes. This is him. How cool does he look? <laughs> And um, this, by the way, is not in Azerbaijan, nor is it in Iran. It is in Rome, in the Villa Borghese, which I believe is in Rome. I think it is, yeah. Um, and this is a statue of Nezami Ganjobi, and I, I love that they chose to represent Nezami, because as I mentioned with the Shah Nameh, these authors are not just relevant for literature written in Persian, or literature from Iran, or the Persianate. And I do want to emphasize this idea because things, I understand that things get labeled and separated, compartmented, if that makes sense, in order for them, for us actually, to study them better. I, ag I agree. I mean, I'm, I have nothing against labels. However, when you encorset so much certain topics, you end up creating a tier of categories, meaning that some of them are going to be more relevant or you are going to transmit them as they are more relevant than others based on multiple reasons. It could be person of reference, which I have nothing against too, or it could be all the stuff that we could comment upon maybe some other time. What I mean with this is that Nezami Kanjabi like Ferdowsi, like Tusi, like Omar Khayyam, like Rumi or Molana, they're not just relevant for the history of literature in the Persianate. They are relevant for the history of literature in the world, in the history of humanity, because of their contribution to literature. And I think it would be a mistake just having a world history literature and only finding them I was going to say Western authors, but not even Western, because Latin America barely makes it into it. Just European or North American authors in this world history literature list. Nezami Ganjavi certainly is someone to consider including in such a collection of people. And uh, today, I hope I will showcase just a tiny bit of his magnificent work, the importance of his writings and how relevant they are still today. We wouldn't even talk about video games. So, where to start? Okay, I know, I know where to start. I made a script, I, I would, yeah. Uh, we need to address something important before actually jumping into Nezami over here, because speaking about the poetic tradition in the Iranian plateau is speaking roughly about the entire history of the land. Most of the works composed between the 8th and the 16th century were, in fact, written in verse. We can expand about this a little bit more in the future, but language and particularly the poetic form are vehicles for the culture of a whole community. That is one of the reasons why but not the sole one, there was this movement of poets, artists, linguists, jurists, and multiple scholars who fought to preserve Persian as the identitarian language opposed to Arabic, which was considered the language for science and education. The verse composition is then extremely important. Poetry is not just a format to tell stories, but a medium on its own, a selected and carefully crafted art to transmit and preserve culture. All of our favorites here, this mountain, by the way, I'm just going to make a little digression here. I gonna, I'm going to start talking about this Twitch channel as the mountain, because Simurg lives in a mountain, and I love mountains, and I, I used to address this Twitch channel as this corner of the internet. It is not a corner, it is a mountain. A remote one, because not many travellers come here, but this is a mountain, and I like that. And this is our mountain, Bacha. Mine, yours, ours. It's end of digression. Um, 
I was saying that many of our favorites here in the mountain are written indeed in verse. The Shaw Nome, the Garshos Nome, the Shabrang Nome, and many, many others. All the Nomes. <laughs> I will get sidetracked no longer with this topic because, my God, I could speak about these for hours, days, weeks. But, but just remember that poetry and poetic composition were pivotal for the formation of what what we know today as literature in Persian or Persian literature. You might have detected that I'm not saying Persian literature, but literature in Persian, meaning written in Persian. Why is that? This is because a concept Persian encapsulates and musters much more than just the language. And it is a whole culture. That is the reason why we address these area, Iran and like modern day Iran and all the surroundings as the Persianate world. Because it's not just a matter of borders, not even geographical borders, but a matter of culture and shared common ground tradition and folklore. Therefore, I think it's a little bit more accurate speaking about literature written in Persian because a lot of Persian literature, meaning belonging to the Persian culture, was written in other languages, like languages from Central Asia. It was written in Arabic because I said that the, the language for science was in Arabic. Is that, how, how is that possible? Because the scientists, the scholars, the lawyers, the poets, the jurists, they did read in Arabic, they did, they did write in Arabic because it was the language to use. But, but their works belong to the Persian culture because they were involved in it. They were personally living that moment within the Persian culture. Am I making any sense? <laughs> but I, I, think I, I think I am. And, and if I'm not, just feel entirely free to ask if you're not following. But I thank you, no soy Ros, but you are a big fan of, of the Persian world. Maybe... Shoyad, perhaps, uh, all the people, I'm not making that much sense to. But if that is the case, remember that you can ask at any moment. This is not a class. This is just a conversation. This is just me telling you something I am passionate about, which is Nezami Ganjobi and the Hamsa. But this is why I intendedly choose to address this as literature written in Persian or literature in Persian, because... To me, Persian literature is much more than just the language. We are addressing the culture when we say Persian literature. All right, I'm stopping there because it's been 30 minutes of stream and I made very little to nonsense myself, am I not? This is a solid tea, by the way. This is a supermarket brand. I bought this in the supermarket. I think it was little. I don't know, but it's good. It's very good, isn't it? Um, surprisingly good, because it was ridiculously cheap. Okay, um, let us meet today's protagonist, or at least one of the multiple protagonists, because there's so many people you are to meet in the session. What is that picture? I'm always confused, which is broader, Persian or Iranian? Persian. Persian is a broader one. Iranian is much more geographically centered. It's not wrong, because I, I choose... The thing is, Persian is the global one, and it is the one used for arts, it is the one used for music, it is the one used for food. Uh, however, I like saying Iranian because um, Persia is an exonym, and I don't like the word Persia. I no, because they never they never address themselves as such. Not even the Mongols, not the Timurids, nor the Safavids. No, no, no. They were Eran Zamin, Eran Shar, Arya. Therefore, we should use the names that are closer to, you know, to the original. Yes, I, I, I agree. The the it is a sensitive topic. Um, Yes, but I am very happy to talk about this with a lot of people. I would love to invite someone that could talk about this as a true Iranian slash Persian culture person, because I'm, this is something I acquired three years. This is not the culture I was raised, born and, and developed in. That will be so interesting. I need to find someone and then invite them to the Nomad's Girl, because I would love that. Um, Okay, so 
Let's start with the context. And in this case, the context is the author himself. Again, a warm round of applause to <clears throat> Nezami Ganjavi, born around 1141 in Ganja, currently Azerbaijan. But back in the day, it was under control of the Turkic Atabegs. Although Nezami Ganjavi was not his real name, his real name was considerably different than his pet name. He was called Jalal Sorry, Jamal. Jamal ad-Din Abu Muhammad Ilyas ibn Yusuf bin Zaki. His name, as in his, his um, first name, was Ilyas. If you were curious, which is the Arabic slash Persian version of Ilyas, which I don't know to pronounce in English, by the way, but it's, um, I think it's Elijah. Yeah, Elijah? Yeah, I, I think it's that one. But we will be calling him Nezami for this stream. And uh, Nezami was an orphan and an early one, unfortunately. He was raised and educated by his maternal uncle, Raja Umar. Raja, yeah, Raja Umar, who was devilishly rich and could secure an excellent education for the boy. And he was not just um, a poet. But a sort of philosopher, spirituality finds its place among his works, as we will see a bit further on. But he's not, he's not a philosopher the same way even Sina was a philosopher. But it is true that at some point in his life, Nezami received the, the nickname Hakim, which is sage or wise. However, he's not... He's not um, a philosopher by definition. Let's just say that he was really into spirituality. And um, it was important. It was something important he cared for. Yeah. And uh, Nezami was patronized by a lot of different... Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the claps. Oh, okay. Um, uh, were those for me? Or were those for Captain Pichu? Because he also deserves a round of applause. Oh yeah, um, the situation in Ganja when Nezami was active. Oh, thank you, Haley Mabnun. Um, uh, when Nezami was active uh, as a poet, the situation in Ganja varied notoriously, and I I brought a map because context is the when, but also the where. And where's my map? Where is my map? There it is. Um. So, this is a modern day map, but that little dot is Ganja, and at the time it was considered part of the Persianate because um, Nezami, while Nezami was active, he was patronized by a lot of different rulers, and they even were, he even worked for rival dynasties. I'm talking about the Seljuks, of course, one of my favorites, but also the Eldiguzids. And um, those maintained the control of, of Ganja during the most part of the later 12th century. And then we have the Shirvan Shahs, and um, we have a lot of people in here. However, he avoided courts, and generally, he's believed to have had a very much secluded life. He was not a court poet. But he does not appear in the annals of the dynasties, which are that they list the names of events of the ruling families. However, Nezami is not found there. Nezami was much more the person to stay in with a book book. With a book book, did I say? A good book, yes, you know, cold up with a cozy blanket and a cooper and reading his favorite book. Am I not a truthful representation of Nezami Ganjavi at this moment? Yes, I am, because I also endorse that kind of plan. Who are you? Who of you, Bacha, do love reading with a nice cup of a warm drink and a blanket on a cold day? Because I do. Hands up or like say something in the chat if you do, because to me that is a plan, I, a, a solid plan. I, I do love going out because I'm a very, a very, very social butterfly and I enjoy company, but it's a, it's a balance between them two. For that, for those readings, okay, for those readings indeed. 
Do I need to go make more? Hmm. I think in the in the rewards of the points, you can go make me um, go to make another cup. I don't know. It's been a while. It's been a while, and nobody uses them, so it's all right. Um, so. Um, Okay, so I was saying that Nezami greatly enjoyed reading, and apparently, uh, according to a literary scholar called Chalkowski, it seems that Nezami's favorite pastime was reading Ferdowsi and the Shonome. So Nezami, like me, like many of you, was a big fan of Ferdowsi and the Book of Kings. And also, he addresses in his own works, Nezami Ganjavi addresses Ferdowsi as the wise, the Dana, which means the knower, the wise, or the, the Hakim, the sage, as I mentioned, and the great master of this cause. And I think that is adorable because we have evidence that Nezami enjoyed and respected Ferdowsi's work so much that he created sort of spin-offs of the stories in the Shah Nameh, and that's what we're talking about today. I am, oh my God, I'm so happy. Also, I have this picture. Uh, of the, this is another statue, another commemorative statue of Nezami Ganjovi, but I've been, I, I'm not capable of remembering where this was from. It's not Iran, it's not Azerbaijan, and it's somewhere in Central Asia, I reckon, but I don't remember. Apologies, very sorry, because as you can imagine, we do not preserve any portrait from the time from Nezami Ganjovi. Sometimes they are represented in manuscripts, Ferdosi is depicted in many manuscripts. But those manuscripts are centuries after, like centuries apart from his real time. However, he is somehow there with a standard face. I don't know if we have Nez Army. Sure, we have. You are right, Pichu. He worked for a lot of people because there was a lot of harana <laughs> all that time and place. Yes, it was. Um, it was an agitated area, definitely. That is that is for certain. Um, I said that he worked for multiple nobles and princesses, and princess, princess, princesses, like anyone. But he always managed to stay somehow away from courtly affairs and be creatively fairly independent compared to all the contemporary and later authors he preserved notably his artistic freedom. His poetry was influenced by multiple sources, and this is something I love, because on the one hand, he was in contact with the Christian communities living in Ganja, but also with the mystic Sufi congregations. And apparently, as I mentioned before, Sufism and mysticism were one of his high interests. And of course, the epic genre. The Shah Nameh was written for a hundred years and it was already established as the Persian language literature masterpiece. And um, yeah, Nizami knew. We know Nizami knew. Ferdowsi knew. Nizami's poetry was focused in daily affairs of his characters, on the day-to-day -day aspect of whatever he was narrating. And that is something particular to him the one of the elements that make him outstand in a sea of very well educated poets and artists the human factor was to gain popularity not only among authors but also in the artistic circles and illustrations would occupy themselves more and more with representations of the daily life of the Iranian communities even the courts rather than offering great scenes of um, enthronement or battles for example those continue to be present because they're popular but not that popular as art history changes and um, i don't want to say evolves because it's not an evolution but yeah changes through time all right so we have the author let's meet the other five protagonists and i'm gonna make i'm gonna use another image Juan that I really love. This is Juan. Juan. <laughs> Francisco. Um, let's use this one. If you know who these people are, first of all, I'm impressed. Second of all, perhaps you were in last week's stream. And third of all, don't say, don't say just yet. Don't say just yet. Just let me, let me get there. Because, yes, but child. 
Yes, indeed, we are going to delve into the wonders of the Hamsa, which means five in Arabic, also known as the Panj Ganj. In Persian, the five treasures. The fantastic five, if you ask me. This is Nezami's masterpiece. But it was never thought to be as such. How come Plumas Hanum? These fireworks were composed separately. And after Nezami passed, the stories were compiled in a single volume. That is the reason why there is not narrative coherence between them because they were never conceived to be together. They were composed at different times of his life in different circumstances. And this is something relevant that people forget to mention more often than I like to admit. Why I am emphasizing the uniqueness of each tale? Because it is important to properly learn about them and not thinking of them as prologues or chapters or episodes of a larger work. Nezami's Hamsa is inserted in a modern-day created category to study Persian literature and literature in Persian, the same as the epic genre. We call this poetic narrative or narrative poetry. And I said modern-day created because back then when it was composed, there was not, there was not a label to give it, there was not a category. I mean, Nezami did not put on his literature study glasses and said, huh, I am to compose a masterpiece in the poetic narrative genre. Nah, <laughs> not quite. There is not a perfect categorization for literature or like literature written in any language, let alone passion works, because there are nuances to it. But we have to study them somehow. So, all right. What is it we call poetic narrative or lyric narrative? You guessed it is they are verse compositions that tell a story. As simple as that. The importance, contrary to all the genres, relates in the plot and the actions from characters. And of course, there is a teaching to these stories. They transmit a message and aimed for their listeners to learn something. Whether something you must or should do, or something you may never, ever consider doing. Oh, and I say listeners. This is important. I almost forgot. I say listeners because remember that these works were not consumed as we would read nowadays. Nay, these books were not thought to be read silently at home with an ice copper. Rather, they were conceived to be recited out loud to be presented to the public orally. The same way I read to you the Book of Kings, these works, all of these works were to be presented in, in public and they were professional reciters and professional performers that went court to court and travelled and were hired by princes and nobles and kings sometimes to perform certain works. The Shahnameh was a favourite, of course, but also the Eskandar Nameh, uh, some of the pieces from the Hamsa, maybe the Psalm Nome, the Garshas Nome, all of them. Can we say this book is an anthology of his works? Definitely, yeah. Anthology is a solid word. And yes, I like that one, yeah. Well supported, Captain. Yeah, definitely. It is an anthology of his works. Um, okay. Um, the works within the Hamsa are quite different from one another and I am following tradition here and I am presenting them to you in chronological order so I, ca I can't find what is it oh there you go Why is it still so slightly to the... Oh, no, okay. There you go. I'm going to start 
with the first one. This is the one that, for me, has the most powerful title of them all. The Marsan al Azrar, the treasure of mysteries. The title, though, the treasure of mysteries. Like. Uh, this was written either in 1163 or 1179. The dates are debated. And this is the most different work of them all. It is nothing like the other four. This is an esoteric poem, philosophical and theological. It is composed like a speech and it is the only work within the Hamsa that does not have a narrative plot. Ta-da! See, the limitations of modern categorizations aforementioned. Well, we are not to cut this little one from its siblings. And, and the Hamsa without... This one is not a Hamsa. So the Maxan contains 20 discourses that occupy varied themes. For example, royal justice, eschatology, and education for princes, especially the latter. This poem presents the portrait of an ideal governor, according, of course, to the moral and spiritual standards of Nezami's time. Beautiful images we preserve from illustrated manuscripts or from this work. And allow me, this is one of them, allow me to navigate one of my favorites. What if This was just... Let me show you. If I can find it. <laughs> so many images. There you have it here. What we have here is the episode, the story of Harun al-Rashid going to meet his barber. The name might ring a bell because, yes, Harun al-Rashid is a famous caliph from the One in a Thousand One Nights. And um, I wanted to show you, this is a far bit illustrated page. Remember, it's not correct to say this is miniature because this is definitely not mini. This is huge, bear in mind. And also miniature is a term much more... It was tailored for European manuscripts and then it passed on to the Iranian world. However, it's not correct. You should not use miniature. If you want, you can use illustration illumination, or if you want to be extremely precise, negargari, which is the Persian word. Um, was that Sora? For me, this book, it's start of what Atar and Molana go to continue. Mystic, mystic poems and stories and love poems. Number five and seven always wear holy and secret in Sufism. Yeah, and that might be one of the reasons why they compiled the, these five works after Nezami was... Um, had to pass away and I, I think it might have something to do with that because it's much more a traditional thing than it was the poet's intention if that makes any sense so this illustration my god do you remember what I was saying about the day-to-day -day life gaining importance in artistic representations these is the perfect example of that and i'm leaning on the on, on the desk because i am i'm going to put on my teacher my art history teacher pose but sure this picture incredible um we know you you don't but i do and i'm now you know because i'm telling you that the protagonist of this episode is the the, the caliph harun al-rashid Traditionally, the governor, the caliph, should be in the center, in a bigger size, because it's more important. Nevertheless, he's put... Can you spot Harun al-Rashid? Can you tell me who of all these people Harun al-Rashid is? Because if you take a general look at the image, you would discover that all people are the same size. Standard size. They are all represented in the same importance and dignity and manner. This is why daily life, just routinary activities become more and more popular because people want to know about the lives of the others like them. 
And in here, we have people at that. This is the hammam. This is the public bath. And there is a lot going on. Uh, on the one hand, we have Harun al-Rashid. If you didn't spot him, he is at the top left. He's having his head washed and he's going to be, uh, you know, he's going to be use the water handed to him in this wee bucket by another servant. Then below, we have two people that are bathing themselves with water. On the other side or to the right, we have at the top, do you see the golden door? This is one of the entrances and there you can see the clothes and the crown of Harun al-Rashid because he has his dress in order to enter the hammam. And then below we have a, a bunch of people that either are entering the hammam, therefore they're getting undressed, but they could also be leaving the hammam and they're getting dressed. The person uh, to the far right, the black person there, it's a worker from the hammam and he's hanging the towels in order for them to dry properly. There is the composition of this image. It's so symmetrical. In fact, if you see the door, the one to the far right, this is outside the limits of the margin because it's, it's devouring the page in order to create a much more realistic space. The perspective, these, these aerial perspectives that the people are using here, the artists and the drawers and the painters are, are using, it's for us to see the floor and the tiles. It can be a little bit strange because we don't see like this. I mean, this is not how the human eye perceives space. I know. They did know too, by the way. Always remember, but uh, the ancient were ancient, but they were not stupid. They just were ancient. I love saying that. And um, the detail of the day-to-day -day activities, the detail on the tiles located in every wall, the differences on the floor, this is beauty at its finest. And this has nothing to do with the purpose of the speech, meaning that what was happening in the hammam when Harun al-Rashid visited is irrelevant to the plot. It is just a visit and you should be only focusing, you reading the story and listening to the story, you should only be focusing on Harun al-Rashid. However, art, take this to a whole new level of complexity, of realism, because you, I know what you're going to say. Plumas, this is not realistic. This is not using the um, realistic approach. To them, there was, because it's a realistic scene. I mean, there's people in a public bath. It's an insta pick of the moment. And the way the people are shown meet a cut in the middle of an activity. They're not posing. They are just doing stuff. This the, the the servant or slave, we don't know, it's you know, hanging the towels, the other person taking their hat, the other person taking like putting on, taking off the coat, the garment, I know the other person being assisted to dry the hands. Getting dressed, getting undressed, I don't know, maybe he was, he was being handed a towel. And this is why, among many other reasons, art history is fantastic. Because this is how a public hammam at the Safavid time would have looked like. This is our window to the past. Where archaeology and lit like um, written sources can't go. Art can and does indeed go. And the combination of all of them, of all the disciplines, the multidisciplinarity is what gives us the full picture, all the pieces of the puzzle that fit perfectly. And therefore we have this. Ah, I am sorry, I got sidetracked, but art history is my thing. I would, I was asked once if I would study again my, my degree, art history, or whether if I would choose something else, I will continue taking our history all the time, every time. Yes, it's, um, I love, I love this. I, <laughs> I do really enjoy it. Well, now we talked about Harun al-Rashid and we talked about the Maxan. Uh, I bet, just taking the account this is going to be long because now we are going to move to the best seller of the time. And I'm not even, that is not, that is not even a thing of speech. It was a, it was the bestseller of the time. 
the best known story from the time of the Sasanians to even today, none other than the story of Khosrow and Shirin, written either in 1120, sorry, 1177 or 1180. Again, we don't know. By the way, this is one of the stories, the many stories condensed in the Shahnameh. However, Nezami did not venture beyond Ferdowsi's narration, nor attempted to retell the story. He himself admitted that the story was not his original creation, and tiptoed around what the Book of Kings had already covered in a sort of summary, we could say. Oh yes, your two besties. Why? <laughs> because you like Hosro, I know you do. And um, uh, yeah, he, he created a, a sort of summary and then explained and expanded in the stormy romance between the Sasanian king Hosro II and the Armenian princess Shirin. There is, there is a lot of drama in this one. There is a love triangle, there is a sculptor named Farha, there is an utter disaster, the definition of tragedy. But if we know a wee bit of the Iranian tradition, we know that they do enjoy a good crying, ugly crying I'm talking about here. And um, they love the trauma. My God, they do, don't they? And... Um, would you like a spoiler? I mean, would you like me to mention more or less what this is about? I tell you, I don't know, you, you know me now. If you want to consume the story in some other format, let me tell you, there is a video game called The Tale of Beastoon by Black Cube Studios and an online comic um, by GP Sibili on webtoons titled Ancient Lovers, Josro and Shirin and there you can access i really like this comic i really like the art and um i'm going to show you another of the most depicted because we we were we are talking about art history so we will never stop this one this episode of Josro sporting shirin bathing was so popular like so, so popular in the Persian aid that as you can see, there's only two examples, but there's plenty, multiple. And um, they copied, they follow the same visual archetypes, visual structure, they were repeated and repeated and repeated, so much so that you can identify what this is without a text. If you see this somewhere, anywhere, now you can say, ah, I know, this is Hosro and this is Shirin, and she's taking a bath, and she is seeing her. Um, <laughs> so you have here your two besties, uh, Umberto, and uh, yeah, this is, oh my god, this, this, this is intense. Uh, I get, I'd, would you like me to tell the story, or do we move into the next one? Because maybe you don't want any spoilers, and I understand. The one to the right is so pretty, with the background making it look like it's mid-autumn and the selection of colors. And also the cypress tree is there, which is very important because the cypress is a tree of kings and royalty, among many other things, because the cypress is multifaceted, like the kings and princes from Iranian uh, literature. Okay, so now we're going to move on to one of my favorite stories absolutely you, you would like to hear the story oh okay um so i'm going to rewind a little bit we are still with Hosro and Shirin. so um i think i have a picture of Hosro enthroned there you go he is gorgeous isn't he so cute to the right dress up in blue that coat though that Coat. Mm, incredible. Um, oh yeah, that is the game, The Tale of Beast Toon. I played the demo and I really liked it, but I think I played it on Twitch actually. But I, I never got to play the whole game. Maybe in the future, I don't know. Um, so this is Hosro, enthroned, and he is 
um, the Sasanian king. This is um, how to say this. It's um, not really faithful biography of um, of King Khosrow, but this is him. And he is to be wed with an Armenian princess called Shirin. And um, he sees her portrait and he falls in love with her. Shirin is very much aware that she is to marry this person. And um, one day, because Shirin is quite a free spirit, if I must say so. And one day she goes out horse riding and stops for a bath. And um, Kai Khosro sees her and he doesn't recognize her but he does fall in love with her he, like my god this this woman is beautiful and um then afterwards they they <laughs> he goes visit her and um this is him later on visiting shirin at her palace this is such a good look at the tower look at the tile work on the tower it's just oh my goodness there's another scene of Shirin seeing the portrait of Khosrow in a garden that one is too much that one is too, too pretty for my screen to hold so the thing is they are going to get married and Shirin is off to uh, Iran to meet his uh, her future husband and then, and then, she's accompanied by multiple, multiple servants. And among them, there is this poor soul called Farhat. Farhat is a sculptor that falls profoundly in love with Shirin. Here we have them, um, Shirin on horse, and Farhat showing Shirin that he carved a milk fountain in the bloody mountain for his princess because she was hungry and thirsty. So he does a lot for her. There's another episode in which for the horse not to step on muddy, muddy soil, he carries them, both the horse and Shirin up the horse, on his back. And he also carves his faces, both hers and another one, some Shirin and the mountain. It is tormentous because Shirin, as much as she is flattered, she has zero to negative feelings of her heart. And this is this is tragic for him. And um, Shirin does get married to Khosro, and the two lovers go, you know, they undergo multiple problems. Until in the very end, Khosro is assassinated, he's murdered, and witnessing the death of his eternal love, Shirin also commits suicide. Because, because this is an Iranian drama and we came here for the drama. Therefore, I'm here. I am delivering it to you. Uh, this was a bestseller. It is very intense. Intense is a definition of Iranian literature. Honestly, they do love... I mean, Gatselot, you are joining us in the reading of the Book of Kings. You know where the level is. Like, it is so high. The drama. The drama. Anywho, now we are going to move to one... All my favorite stories. Um, oh my god. And I don't mean one of my favorite stories in the Hamsa. I mean one of my favorite stories ever. Which is a story of Layli and Mishnoon. Perhaps you know of it as Layla or Layla and Mishnoon. Why is that? Because Layla is the Arabic name and Layli is the way the Iranians pronounce it. And I like Layli a lot because um, one of my dearest friends uh, who I was doing my PhD with, she said, she said Tehruni, she's Iruni, and she said Layli all the time. And, and I, I just like how it sounds. I think it's so sweet. Um, this is, to put it in short, the most beautiful yet the saddest of all stories from within the Khamsa. And that is 
my absolutely definitely substantive opinion i'm i'm very biased extremely biased uh you go and read it and you can't refute then you can refute me if you feel so brave that this is not the saddest story and the most beautiful one in the hamsa go ahead i'm, I'm waiting here interestingly enough though Leili Omashnun is not a story from the Iranian tradition, but from the Arabic tradition. I'm going to show you them one day. It's cool because... <laughs> Look at them. This is Leili and Mashnun at school. Ah! I love this image so much. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do the whole uh, history commentary on this one because that, I feel that would be a little bit too much. But I, I, I think this is so beautiful. This is, oh, this is a jewel. This page is a masterpiece. A jewel. Um, anyhow, um, I'm saying that it, is from the, it comes from the Arabic tradition. And uh, the story contains great detail about the nomad tribes that lived in the Arabian Peninsula. And the main protagonists of the story are Layli, a lovely girl, and Kais, a dreamy boy that they are not really cousins but distant cousins because of these tribal relationships and when they're kids they fall in love and they love each other very much and it's very pretty unfortunately of course of course things do not occur as these two lovers would like because the love Kais feels for Leili reaches the delusion, craziness. And this is the reason why he obtains his nickname and the sobriquet that has granted him a place in the history of literature, Mashnun. Mashnun means crazy. And because he's feeling a love so intense that he's gone mental his brain is damaged because of that he's rejected he's not when he asks to marry Layli, the father of Layli refuses him as a groom because who would want their daughter to marry a mad man that is what he is a mad man unfortunately therefore guys uh willingly voluntarily when he's not allowed to marry Layli, exiles himself into the wilderness to live with the animals. And um, there are so many things in here. I, I think I could do just one just one story about this. I, I, I'm willing to take a whole live stream on the story of Majnun. Anywho, um, when Majnun runs away from civilization, he suffers tremendously and the animals are the only ones who accompany him in his penitence he is the embodiment of human pain both physical and emotional but i adore mishnun tremendously he represents the core human sentiment this humanity each of us have inside and uh, the way he has, the way he builds up relationships with the animals, it is so pure, so sweet, so intense. And you can see here that all the animals befriend him, the gazelles, the lions in the bottom left, the coyotes in the bottom right. He is his true company and he feels listen, listened to and he feels somehow accepted by animals in this world he has conveyed for himself because he truly believes he's mad and not suitable for living with humans that's the reason why he sets off into the wilderness like i if i if my feelings cannot accommodate these social standards because they are wild therefore i should live with those my kind the animals those who feel extremely and passionately and without restrictions trust the matter Mashnun suffers so much and he dedicates a lot of song, songs and poems to Layli and allow me to tell you something about Mashnun and I want to show you the exact image from the episode because it is 
precious and adorable. And um, I just want you to know him a little bit better. At some point in the story, Majnun voluntarily gives up his own horse. Something incredibly valuable at the time. I cannot emphasize enough how important, relevant and expensive was to have a horse. But he, he gives up the horse willingly. Why? So a gazelle and his calf can be spared from being killed. But come on, come on. This is the kind of person Mushnun is. Willing to sacrifice everything for the well-being of those he cares for, including the animals. And as a person who loves animals, sometimes more than I do love people, I resonate with Majnun so much. Same question as with <laughs> Jose Rowan Shirin. Would you like me to continue the story? Would you like me to tell you how roughly the story occurs? Because I would love you to read it. I do prepare napkins. This one. Oh, this one is a hit to the heart. This one is so cruel. To me, it's cruel. It reaches the point of cruelty. It does. Because as, as you think, if you want to listen to the rest or not, this poem has been observed under the lenses of both physical and mental, uh, sorry, and spiritual love. Because the love between Majnun and Leili is so pure. First of all, they never consummate the union. They never make it physical because of things. But this is why the interpretations of the poem are two folded. On the one hand, we have the narrative story of a person forbidden to be with the one he loves and uh, the suffering and the human pain that entitles, of course. But on the other, this has been used as a symbolism of the purity uh, of spiritual love. But how, yeah, pure, pure is a good word. How pure love can be regarding the relationship of the soul and God. This is the Sufism, the Sufi reading of, of this poem. However, I love to talk about them together because I do not consider they were to be separated initially, at least not what Nezami would have wanted because he, when he describes the pain Mishnun is suffering, he's very physical and real about it. Certainly, there's a lot of mysticism and poetry uh, implied on this, but... But at the very end of the day, Mishnun is a heartbroken person who has just been carried away by madness and craziness just out of his own pain. And um, this human aspect of Mishnun's story is something I feel should not be forgotten. Of course, the relationship between these two lovers, these, these connection they have, this relationship so pure, so intense, is also a very good synonym of how the soul reaches out to the one in Sufism, which is God. And the spirit and the sentiment is expressed through love. So I really like this poem. Do read it, please. <laughs> do you read Leili and Majnun? Um, do, you want it to spo do you want me to spoil it for you? Or do I carry on because it's been... We have still two more to go. Um, we are on the third one, so oh, the, the next one is so cool. Uh, the next one is a little bit happier. I well, yeah, it's happier. It, it is happier. It's not as tragic, but but this one is the this one is hard. Yeah, I'm just I'm just thinking things. But let us see again. Oh, I love this image so much. Like I, this one is my I think it's my favorite representation of Majnun, and I have a lot. There's another one. This also was represented widely, this visual archetype of Majnun holding the calf in his arms because he is so, so perfect and precious. He's a pan de Dios, okay? He is a bread from God. And um, something I enjoy of this image is there is a variety of animals intendedly represented here. We have deer, we have foxes, we have the coyotes, the lions, the snow white leopards, we have the onagas, we have the wolves. And the gazelle, of course, in the middle of the image. The richness of this illustration 
goes beyond me. Every single time, every time, let me tell you, every time I see it, I fall in love. Okay, we're going to move on to... Let's start with you, shall we? Oh, aren't you a handsome man? Now, the fourth story, may I introduce you to the Haft Paikar, the seven beauties. This is a story also covered in the Shaoname. Nezami acknowledges that and explains how he will be covering a different side of the tale. This is, by the way, the fantasized biography of a Sasanian king, Bahram V or Bahram Gur. Someone I have in considerably high esteem. I really like him, I swear, I do. <laughs> Bahram is a fun guy. I, I like him. Yeah, I like his performance in the show. I mean, a wee better than I like the... the um, this, this illustration, by the way, this is not from a Hamza. This one is from a show. I mean. but, um, but I like him. I do. Okay, so let me show you. Bahram Gur grows up in the palace of Hornak, which has multiple secret rooms and passages. And one day, the boy discovers a room with seven portraits of seven enthralling, outstandingly beautiful women. The princesses of the seven climates. And yes, I'm saying climate. I'm not talking about the weather. If you've been with us here in the mountain for a long time, you know that in the Iranian cosmological thought, the world was divided into seven areas, which they were called Keshvars. The word Keshvar in Persian, in modern day Persian, means country. Do not use the word country, use climate, believe me. And um, these seven princesses represent each of the seven climates according to the Iranian belief. And the Mazdayasna, this comes from the Mazdayasna, the Mazdi and the Zoroastrian tradition. And we have India, China, Rome, well actually Rome, okay, we have Rum. And Rum is debated because it could be Hwada the room the anatolian peninsula like the room sultanate or rome because why not and we have also maghrib and turkestan Khorasmia and sakaliba of course we have iran too do you know what sakaliba was it's a difficult one umberto this question is for you do you know which climate sakaliba belongs to do you, do you, would you pass a Sasanian geographical test? <laughs> if you don't, don't worry. I, I didn't figure out myself either because it's, again, it's difficult. Um, so Bahram sees the seven portraits and falls in love with those seven princesses at the same time. I know, yeah. It, it, yes, uh, why? Because he's Bahram good and he, he's, he's capable, I know. So he sets off to find them and bring them all to his palace. To each princess, he builds a pavilion with a corresponding color and he goes to visit them in a specific day of the week. Oh, sorry, Lulujun, apologies. Oh, be bashed, Lulujun. Are you okay? Um, I scratch your face. Sorry. Um... Yeah, there's a specific day for each princess and a specific planet. And if you are Save, you might be detecting how much cosmology is happening in this tale. Yes, you are correct. The, the princesses are a representation of the cosmological thought of Iranian philosophy. And again, going back to the Master Yasna. And um, the princesses gave uh, Bahram advice in the shape of stories, much more as it was tradition, because how powerful narrative is, like, incredibly. This is a sandalwood pavilion, and this is the black pavilion from the princess of India. This one is gorgeous, beautiful. It is so magnificent. I love the representation of the half pikar. It's, um, they are something else also you might see the tale translated the haft, haft paikar literally means the seven beauties however for some reason there are some translations that present the title as the seven wise princesses i mean it's not wrong because they they feature indeed seven wise princesses yet it's not the original 
I, I don't know the reasoning behind that. Um, oh yes, and we have in here the the turquoise pavilion, and I'm going to show you. In here, we have the whole pavilion and Bahram Gur and the princess there. This dancing, this music, this wine. But also, I want you to see the the pavilion on top because they've represented the ceiling, uh, the, the rooftop. And I really like it. It is so cute how this construction is going further than the margin reserved specifically for the illustration and just breaks the limits and grows up into the sky. Therefore, given this sense of verticality, it was intended because the pavilion were, you know, elongated. They were very vertical in, the, in their shape. Um... There is good editions of the Seven Princesses of the Half Pie Card, but uh, for those of you who don't know the story, do you want me to tell you, or do you want to discover them by yourself? Don't don't feel forced to say anything. I know, Pacha, that you are shy, but perhaps you want to. I don't know. By the way, I didn't say because I think Umberto mm, is not here, but Sakaliba is the land of the Slavs. Meaning anything, you know how the Cas where the Caspian Sea is. So anything north to the Caspian Sea was Sakaliba because they knew there were people there. What kind of people? The Slavs. What are the Slavs? Blonde, pale people. Don't ask. Do you do you think we had stereotypes back in like? Do you think we have stereotypes? They did too. It's like oh yeah, you know the. The, the fair-skinned people, those there, north of the Caspian, yes, I mean, the... <laughs> people. <laughs> Blue-eyed people, I don't know. Um, so, okay, I think, I think, we can go to the final one. Ah, yes, we're going to go to the fifth one. Where do I have the image of the fifth one? I have a lot. I'm gonna put up this one. Oh, this one is so beautiful. I wish I had time to tell you this story. What is going on here? Um, we are, the time clock is ticking. They've been here a long time. So, the fifth story, the fifth jewel, is no other than the Skandar Nome. All the work of Alexander. Because he has to be in all the cocidos, like we say in Spanish. Yeah, this is the story of Alexander the Great. Which, allow me to tell you something regarding a comment that was left on my recorded paper for Arc Talk uh, this year. I was talking about the representations of Persepolis in different modern media and of course I had to mention Eskandar and uh, you know I cannot just say I think he's famous enough for me to say Alexander however his nickname the name that has been written in the annals of history is Eskandar the Great Alexander the Great I did not name him the Great, but his full name in history is Alexander the Great. It's just a name with... It's, it's um... How to explain this? It's an establishment. It's in accord... It's, 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 it's in accord with reach. Traditionally... We, yeah, that's, that's how he enters the room. Eskandar is called Alexander the Great. That's just his name. A comment was left saying, it kind of like giving me a hard time because I mentioned the great and said, oh, Alexander, not so the great or not the great. It's like, pal, I get it. But this is not me saying that he's great. This is me saying his name because his name is Alexander the Great. Whether we like it or not, I don't like it. I don't think he's a great. But I name him as such. It is like, Cyrus the Great. Kurushev Ozorg. You could say not. Why? 
because he's gone. He's passed on history as Kuro Zorg, Cyrus the Great. And, um, you know, like Julius Caesar. Julius. <laughs> no, it's just these things happen. So while I understand where the comment is coming from, meaning that Escandar is a very debated figure and controversial at some point because people are divided between or whether he was a demon or a savior, a fantastic figure, in a, like a, a good figure for the Iranian history and the development of the Iranian plateau's history, or something terrible, a calamity, a catastrophe that befell upon the Iranian plateau. That is not the debate. Unfortunately, whether we like it or not, his name is Iskandar the Great. This is not me endorsing his greatness. I just wanted to to tell you because sometimes people just comment for the sake of commenting. And um, I mean, if that is everything you have to say about my intervention, that means you liked it. So thank you. Um, so moving back to our intense Lade, the story was written either in 1194 or between 1196 and 1202. And the tale summarizes the three periods on the life of Eskandar according to the Iranian folklore. First, we have Iskandar as a conqueror. Then we have Iskandar as a wisdom and uh, knowledge seeker. He gets, hear me out, he gets to meet Simur and everything. I don't know. And finally, we have Iskandar as a prophet in the sense of someone that has an important message to deliver. Like a sage. Like a sheikh. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> like a sheikh. Um... Do not think of Iskandar as a prophet, like the prophet. No, no, Muhammad, there's only one Muhammad and one prophet. But um, he was considered someone to have an important legacy to pass on to the world. The story is no other than a mirror for princes, a projection of what the ideal sovereign must aspire to be. And yes, they picked Iskandar. Don't shoot me, I am but the messenger. Because why why is that? Uh, I'm going to show you something of the of the image uh, in here. This was beautiful, and in in fact, the person represented there, supposedly Escandar, was the commissioner, was a patron that paid for the manuscript. Uh, gossip, art history gossip. Because if you if you think high of yourself, you represent yourself as Escandar the Great. Of course, you do. Um, why is this? Why they would look at uh, Eskandar and think that this was the ideal of a ruler? Because whether we love it or hate it, Eskandar has a powerful impact in the Iranian literary tradition, which embraced him as a hero and mythologized him. He, the Iranian tradition turned Eskandar into an archetype, into a mythological trope, this tale, the Eskandar Nameh, had zero to negative intentions of being historically accurate. That was not the point. That was not the aim for the story. I think the two words, like the mythological archetype, are perfect here because they define exactly what the intention was behind writing the Eskandar Nameh or the process that the figure of Eskandar went through in the... Oh, I'm really sorry. Um... In the Iranian tradition, I, I have another one I can show you. What is it? That was the, the oh yeah, is the, um, the image of Iskandar fighting um, Zanj De Kujai. No, this is Baharam Guru. Wait, I can't, I can't find. There you have it. There we go. So, um, this is one of the reasons why I don't call him Alexander when speaking about the Eskandar Nameh, because this is not the historical figure of the Macedonian king Alexander. This is Eskandar, the archetype, the archetype, the mythological trope of a hero, of an ideal ruler in the Iranian tradition. Eskandar and Alexander therefore take different paths entirely. And this is something we have to understand if we want to comprehend properly the relevance of Eskandar in Iranian literature, because 
the one we're talking about here is not the historical king. It's not the conqueror who passed at 30-something. It's not the blonde-ish guy portrayed by... Uh, oh, what's the name of the actor? Oh, what's the name of the actor? It escaped entirely my brain. I have his face, but I cannot remember his name. I don't know. Bo Angelina Jolie is in that film. She plays Olympia. Um, what I was saying, that this is not that historical king, and there was zero intentions of pretending he was. They needed the recollection of values and ideals that the ideal ruler embraced and represented, and they picked up Escandar, whose legend was great and vast, but the same they did with other people. For example, we don't speak so much about this, but this is the same process that Bahram Gur goes through. Exactly the same one. The Bahram we have presented in the Shahnameh or in the Panch Ganj, sorry, in the Haft Paikar. That one, Colin Farrell. Thank you so much, Pichu. Thank you so, so much. Um, the Bahram Gur that we see performing actions and doing stuff in, in the Hamsa is not the historical Bahram V, is a mythological literary figure. And that is okay, that is correct. If we intend to compare the mythological slash literary version trope to the original, we're going to be very disappointed. And that is where we will be missing the point, because it's not the intention. Absolutely not. These people didn't want the original Greek slash Macedonian Hellas bound king. They wanted another figure that was powerful enough to compel the young princesses and to make them aspire to something greater, like Eskandar had been, according to tradition and legend. So that's a, that's what I mean, and that is the reason why I keep on addressing him as Eskandar, so we can stay and, and, and focus on what we are talking about, and who are we talking about. Alexander, Alexandros, is the Macedonian king. Eskandar is the mythologized archetype in the Iranian tradition, and that is ever present because they did, they did like the folklore and the legend a lot. It is widely uh, repeated and contemplated. Eskandar features in the Shahnameh as well, so you can imagine how popular it was. And um, Bacha, I think that is all I have for today. Thank you so much for accompanying me in this journey through the Hamsa. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something different. And um, why is that, Iloko? This seems to be a common element in nationalist mythology. It is uh, more... I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, I, 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 I hear you. Yet, I would not call this nationalism, first of all, because of the historical moment, and second because of how the process of embracing a culture that was very present, because this is something that is not so much commented upon, but the influence of Hellas, I don't want to say Greece, because there was no Greece at the time, the influence of Hellas in Iran, in the Iranian plateau, is important and huge. It's not just Eskandar. It's not just Alexander going on and about burning down Persepolis, and that's it. There's a whole dynasty that comes afterwards, and then afterwards, and then afterwards. But, um, yeah, yes, well before the, the 90s, definitely. But it's just the assimilation of something that was felt as own. The tradition was so well established that, of course, for the Iranians, this was part of the folklore and the legend. At some point, Iskandar is even compared to Dulkarnain, which is a person that features in the Quran. It's a whole thing. I mean, the phenomenon of Iskandar in the Iranian plateau in the passionate world is vast and extensive and interesting it's just not something i like so much but that's entirely uh, that's entirely a different topic i mean one thing is my personal preference and the other thing is the real importance of escandar by the way look how cool my t-shirt is um Dame veneno que quiero morir. i i do need more venom stuff um so yeah that's that's um the key to comprehending properly the, the tradition and the processes that Iskandar, the figure of Iskandar, the archetype, I love that word, it works so well, the archetype of Iskandar and uh, gone through, yes we are, yes indeed we are, we are Venom. 
Do the Mongols have a similar rendition of Iskandar? They do copy it because when the, when the Ilkhans come to Iran, they assimilate the Iranian tradition as own as well. And they do keep on uh, commissioning copies of the Iskandar Nameh, of the Shah Nameh. They keep on reading the tales of Alexander and they keep on adding to their own background what they learn from the Iranians. And it is such an interesting moment the Ilkhanid world like um Mongol leaders in Iranian mythology no because the thing is this this is a holy book for Iranians not so much as the Quran because this is not a liturgical book in that sense but what is written here is law and tradition and this was thought to represent the real cultural legacy of the Iranian plateau I cannot emphasize enough this idea. Everything comprised in here was what any average medieval ruler in the Iranian plateau had to absorb, to acknowledge, to learn, to assimilate. And this stops in the Arab, in the uh, when the the Arabs come. But this is what made them, according to their own tradition and thought. This is what made them Iranian and different. Um, they did, in fact, just bear in mind that when this is written, it's 1010. The Arabs are, have been in Iran at least for 300 years. But this is a reconstruction of the myth. This is why the Shah Nameh is so important. This is a reconstruction of the mythical, believed past of Iran. It's not historical, but for some people was as such. This was the story of their ancestors their legacy, something they had to embrace and take care of because it was that they were passing this to the future generations. This book is so many things and one of them is that, a vehicle for cultural legacy. Can you explain now why I devoted a whole thesis to only one of the characters? I could keep on expressing the importance of this book forever, but we've been here long enough. So I think, what what do you say? I play Fly Me to the Moon and um, we call it a day because I am beyond happy that you have willingly chosen to spend your evening with me here in our mountain butcher. Thank you so 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 much for choosing me as your um today when is the uh, crusader king three art stream i don't know yet but definitely it's going to happen i possibly will ask you guys on discord i i i'm yeah because i know mostly the the thing is going to be in english because uloco and 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 uh, umberto and also pichu are the ones most interested on it i don't know yet i I need to sit and organize a little bit. Uh, oh, uh, so, uh, so Harab, th those Shanames, I, I understand what you mean, but they are not written, meaning that they copy the original text. They are created, they, they copy it. They are copied and create copies and illustrated. That is a, a better way of putting it. But yeah, Mughal India is wonderful for art and um, one of the images i showed from uh, mashnoon was from Mughal india and i love it i love the Mughals so much and i don't know much about them though i know a bit about the early time because to me that is a, a tad bit too modern but i am a modar bozorg how much of a modar bozorg i am at the moment <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Modar Bozorg is the passion word for grandma. And I feel like like a yaya, which is a Spanish word. Well, actually, the Spanish word is abuela, but yaya is a localism, and I feel like a yaya. That's like now, and I love it. I am willing to embrace my yaya personality. <laughs> I am a nonna. Um, I forgot entirely what I was going to say. Uh, the Mughals, yeah, the Mughals are incredible, and I do... I do encourage you to look up more about the Mughals and their art. But I thank you so, so much for coming to me in this cold evening and enjoy this stream about the Hamsa. In the meantime, you know, we have a... Well, sorry. <clears throat> My voice. Um, You know, 
We have uh, a Discord you can join. We have a Telegram challenge. You can challenge, challenge. We have a Telegram channel you can subscribe to if you are interested in keeping up. It's just like a like a I have to say it is like an announcement board more than anything and the conversation happens on discord and also thank you to my patrons because they are the ones that chose the stream if you want to suggest topics and um if you want to vote for future content or if you just want to give this project a uh, good support just consider joining us on patreon we have a tier that might be for you um I, I know of you know about Sohra Bardi. I love Sohra Bardi is in fact my favorite philosopher. He's my favorite by far. I uh, he's in my thesis actually. I spoke about Akali Surh and um, uh, the the Shrak he is cool and everything is the yeah. I even paid tribute to Sohra Bardi on my daily nine nine to five or actually eight to four daily job. I I have references in my work to Sohra Bardi because he is absolutely my favorite and um uh, yeah just thank you so much and uh, i will see you the next time i don't know i think this monday we have a reading of the book of kings but i don't know i need to check the calendar and um but yeah there's not much left to say but except for i, I couldn't find the word myself except for do not forget to create, to explore, and to have loads of fun. Until I see you next time with my empty cup, with my empty cup, which is a successful stream, I bid you, Joafes! <laughs>